Wade. I'm the chair of Nick Fortino's dissertation committee. Uh, this is Dr. Kaisa Puhaka, and online we have Dr. Is Andrew Saul. That's right. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're here at the end of a long journey for Nick and me, anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to hear the presentation of his uh, formal results and of the study. So we'll begin with that, and if it's, would, Nick, would you prefer to have questions at, during your presentation, or would you rather give the presentation and then allow us to ask questions or comment afterwards? Let's say afterwards. Okay. Okay, and we welcome questions from the audience, too. I'm remembering in this moment that I'll need to audio record this, so I'm going to press record. Okay. So, it really feels good to be here, and I am going to start by talking about what led me to this topic, schizophrenia and the orthomolecular treatment of schizophrenia. And I've been thinking a lot about it, and I wrote down many of my thoughts, so I'm going to start by reading them. I, I, I want to be sure to be accurate. So. Various factors drew me to this topic, and only after completing my master's thesis had I any clue that I would conduct a dissertation study on a treatment for a mental disorder. That thesis paper was about how the death of a loved one can accelerate the griever's development, which I had written very soon after my own mother's death. And so I was ready for a dissertation topic that I was not so intensely close to, one that could have immediate social impact with relevance to many individuals. In the final couple of years of my mother's life, I witnessed a terrible mismanagement of her health, include, but on everyone's part, including her and her doctors, and I later had to painfully own my own ignorance in underneath what I did or did not do in attempting to help her. I watched the combination of pain drugs she was given for her headaches, along with her nutrient-deficient diet, severely impair her memory and speech, and, I believe, kill her. This was my first taste of the prominent medical belief system of this culture. I began learning about the pharmaceutical industry and its influence over medicine practices in this culture. I was and continue to be astonished at how readily mass culture accepts the notion that synthetic chemical compounds are medicine and that ingesting them for long periods of time is unobjectionable. At first I was confused at why many medical doctors scoff at this idea that food can be medicine or that vitamins and minerals or herbs can treat illness until I realized that nutritional training is not part of medical school. Pharmaceutical companies, which form one of the most powerful and lucrative industries in the world, have a financial incentive to keep people somewhere between being alive and dead. Alive enough to pay for drugs, but sick enough to need them, or think they need them. My opposition to this paradigm of medicine and its disincentive to foster health intensified, and I knew that the most effective way to be against something is to be for a solution to it. I became receptive to ideas of a dissertation study that would investigate a solution to the growing problem of this culture's dependence on drugs. Many resources came into my life, but a particular testimony led me to investigate the use of vitamins for mental health. I had been studying orthomolecular medicine for the sake of my own health, and I watched a documentary film in which Dr. Andrew Saul was featured describing a case of a suicidal and totally dysfunctional woman who became completely well after introducing massive daily doses of niacin. Wow. I searched the databases for evidence of niacin and depression, but there was surprisingly very little. I did, however, find a bulk of evidence for niacin as a treatment for schizophrenia. Concurrently, I had been reading the award-winning book by Robert Whitaker, Anatomy of, a, of an Epidemic, in which he meticulously charted the astonishing rise of mental disorder in America and the severe discrepancy between the evidence of psychiatric drugs and the manner in which they are prescribed. 
Another factor that pushed me into this topic was I was taking a class on quantitative research methodolo methodologies taught by a hard-nosed New Yorker who was intolerant of loosely defined topics and shoddily designed studies, Dr. Fred Leskin. One of my takeaways from that class was that some topics lend themselves to a study more than others. And I was under the impression that schizophrenia was a clearly defined construct and that I could potentially conduct a controlled trial comparing, comparing niacin treatment to drug, drug treatment. I consulted many, many faculty members about this and all, all of them advised against it, <laughs> warning that such a study would take more time than I had to graduate. After, after a period of a young man type of rebellion and dismissal of this wise counsel, I met with a close mentor who said just the right thing. He said, you could do a multiple case study and it could still be profound. That was what I needed to hear. And this is what I want my dissertation study to be. I want it to be profound. I acquiesced, giving up the idea of conducting a controlled trial and learning everything that I could about case study research. I started reading a lot about the history of schizophrenia and its different treatments to get a sense of whether there was a need for a multiple case study investigating the orthomolecular treatment of schizophrenia. I found that indeed the need existed. I designed a multiple case study in which I would interview people who formerly used antipsychotics but switched to vitamins as a primary treatment for their condition. I attended the Orthomolecular Medicine Today conference in Vancouver in the time period I was writing the proposal and met with many top orthomolecular scholars and physicians. I inquired with many of them about whether my study idea was realistic and if the population of people my inclusion criteria delineated would be accessible. I was assured they could connect me to people who would qualify for the study and likely want to participate, but these leads were never produced. I was actually very disappointed in the orthomolecular community for how little support and enthusiasm they showed when I was working for them, in a way, attempting to highlight the merits of the field. I told my wife when I wrote to Andrew Saul, asking him to be on this committee, that it felt a bit like the innocent hopefulness of a child writing to Santa Claus. <laughs> he, you'd been a model, model researcher for me and scholar, and I aspire to have the educational influence and courage to challenge pervasive, baseless beliefs. I knew I was fortunate when you agreed to join the committee, and the extent of that good fortune became clear when Dr. Saul provided the one gateway that brought participants into, into my life. He published a call for participants in a widely read newsletter. So. So thank you very much for that. After my proposal was approved, months elapsed with not a single lead, and this was not due to any lack of diligence on my part. I had to modify my study from a minimum of five participants to two. I found three, but I had to exclude one of them, a 47-year-old woman diagnosed with schizophrenia 14 years prior who claimed that her schizophrenic symptoms completely disappeared when she introduced a multivitamin. Throughout the interviews, however, I realized she had not lowered her antipsychotic dosage and did not have a plan to do so, disqualifying her from the study. My central research question was what is the experience of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia who switched from antipsychotic drugs to an orthomolecular regimen as a primary biological treatment? I interviewed each of the primary participants, whose names we'll say are Dale and Bob, for a total of over five hours throughout multiple interviews. I inquired about three particular phases, namely when they were symptomatic but unmedicated, while on antipsychotics, and since introducing the orthomolecular protocol. I also interviewed Bob's mother and sister, and I interviewed Dale's mother, friend, and orthomolecular physician. I pursued interviews with Bob's psychiatrists who had made the diagnosis and, and the prescription of Risperdal, um, but he sent me psychiatric notes, which is an appendix in my dissertation, but he was not willing to interview. 
And then the other participant, Dale, asked me not to contact his psychiatrist, but did I did interview his orthomolecular physician. So a little context of Dale and Bob. Dale is a 26-year-old Caucasian Canadian male. Initial schizophrenia diagnosis at age 23 due to symptoms of intense emotional upheaval and delusional thinking. He was unemployed and living at home at the time of our interviews. He was on Risperdal in two different periods of his life. As you can see, two milligrams for 18 months after being diagnosed with a drug-induced psychosis, hmm. which I found to be odd because the idea of a drug-induced psychosis, as far as I understand, is that those symptoms wane as the drug wanes, but he was on Risperdal for 18 months after that, and he stopped it altogether. And after about nine months of not being on it, he experienced these emotional upheavals and bizarre thoughts, which led to his schizophrenia diagnosis. And so then he was on a much higher dose, 3.5 milligrams of Risperdal for longer, 26 months. He, at that 26 month mark, he was ready to find a different treatment. And as we'll talk about in a moment, the, the effects of Risperdal were devastating for him. And so he found a naturopathic doctor and has a comprehensive regimen, but the significant ingredients in that regimen are 11 grams of niacin and 30 grams of vitamin C daily. So at this point, I'll, I'll give a little more context around the orthomolecular treatment. So the initial trials were done in the 50s by these psychiatrists in Canada. And they developed the hypothesis based on a number of different threads of thinking that high levels of niacin could alleviate schizophrenic symptoms. And one of the main reasons they developed that hypothesis was because the condition latent in all of us that would manifest if our niacin levels dropped too low is called pellagra. And the psychological symptoms of pellagra resemble those of schizophrenia. And, you know, the, this guy, Abram Hoffer, the pioneer of orthomolecular psychiatry, went as far to say as those symptoms are indistinguishable, clinically indistinguishable. The word orthomolecular, to define that term, means correct molecule. And the central tenet of this branch of medicine is that many if not all illnesses derive from a deficiency in naturally occurring biochemical constituents in a person's body and therefore restoring health requires supplying those nutrients in which the person is deficient so that's the whole idea of orthomolecular medicine and it and it has sort of a subfield of, of orthomolecular psychiatry they extend that thinking into mental health. So, a little bit about Bob. Bob is a 28-year-old Asian American male, born into a physically abusive household in an affluent area of Southern California. He had a difficult childhood with a lot of violence and discord between his parents. Um, he, was he had been arrested over six times had two periods in jail, had a serious stealing habit. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia at 24 when he was just, he had delusional thoughts, he was throwing furniture and, and acting violently at the time he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. But I'll mention that he also had a history of involvement with psychiatrists and psychiatric drugs and had a period taking them when he was about eight years old, which, didn't, which lasted about two months and did not go well. So his mother, who I should mention is a medical doctor and kind of oversees his treatment, she ceased that. And then he had another bout with um, a different drug when he was in his early 20s, which according to his mother made him insane. 
stopped that, had another period of time, and then this incident which led to a schizophrenia diagnosis. And he was prescribed Risperdal at 6 milligrams for 13 months. One of the most surprising things I learned in all of this work is the discrepancy between the evidence that led to drugs being approved by the FDA and the way in which they're used in practice now is extreme. It's an extreme discrepancy. The, the trials for approving Risperdal lasted four weeks and the highest dose was six milligrams. And people like Bob are taking it for 13 months. And according to Dale and Bob, their psychiatrists were absolutely set that they would need to be on these drugs for the rest of their lives. So, what did I find in the interviews? Dale, Bob, the mothers, and the other people that I interviewed favored the orthomolecular treatment over the Risperdal treatment. They, Dale has, was able to lower his Risperdal dosage by over half at this point, and he, he lowered it when he introduced this vitamin protocol. Bob was able to cease Risperdal use altogether. From six milligrams, he introduced a multivitamin, which allowed him to lower it to three milligrams. He then introduced a separate niacin supplement of about 350 milligrams, which enabled him to completely stop taking Risperdal without experiencing withdrawal symptoms which is a significant problem in, when people try to come off of the Risperdal. Um, devastating adverse effects of Risperdal. The inability to concentrate, sleeping for about 13 hours a day, and not feeling well rested upon waking. Uh, diminished confidence, the sense that they could not interact with people socially. Uh, suppressed appetite. These are all their reports of what they experienced taking Risperdal at these high doses. The relationships with psychiatrists lacked rapport, to say the least, to put it nicely, and at times were hostile. And as what can be seen in the psychiatric notes is the psychiatrists closed the file, so to speak. They told Dale and Bob that they needed to find a different psychiatrist. When when they found out they were trying a vitamin treatment. So they were not only, not even just dismissive of it, but actively against it. They have experienced significant recoveries after months of being on the orthomolecular treatment. Both of them are functioning at higher levels than they were before the schizophrenia set in, indicating a growth potential in the schizophrenia experience. They, perhaps to me, the most surprising finding and most interesting to me was that the two individuals before taking Risperdal were very different from each other. They were unique, they had very different interests and talents and personalities and lifestyles. On Risperdal, they were strikingly similar to one another. Mo both of them were basically incapacitated. They were confined by the same basic limitations of not wanting to leave the house, not being able to read, not feeling like they could get a job, and they were similar to one another. Upon introducing orthomolecular treatment, their individualities became evident again. So that was, that was an important finding for me, because it's absolutely critical that we have all the parts of our humanity at their best, and wholly themselves, and, whole, and, and cultivating those unique talents that are inborn, and that seemed to disappear during the time they were taking Risperdal. So I've, I've plucked a couple of quotes from these individuals. 
the first one I'll share reflects Bob's relationship with his psychiatrist and, and that service, and then you can read, but I'll narrate. I'd sit there and wait maybe an hour and a half just to see a doctor who was quite frankly not very helpful or interested in my well-being, just more interested in experimenting with different drugs. They weren't very interested in my opinion or how I felt. So this is Bob's perspective, and I'm sure the psychiatrist would have told me differently and maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. But it's very important that people who are struggling with a mental disorder have the very clear perception of being cared about. In regarding Bob's experience while on Risperdal, I pulled quotes from his sister. She said, when he first started heavily using Risperdal, he seemed very unhappy about life. It wasn't like he was going to start setting goals and things he wanted to do in his life. It wasn't like he wanted to do anything normal. His conversations would consist of the exact same thing. He was alive but wasn't alive, she said. His mother, Pam, said he was incapable of focusing. Risperdal hit him over the head with a hammer. Like, okay, if you, if you can't get this person to focus, just knock him out so he doesn't cause trouble. He was so absolutely unproductive, absolutely not present. I asked Bob at the end of our final interview to just give me a sense of those three phases of symptomatic and unmedicated while on Risperdal and since introducing vitamins. And he said, pre-Risperdal was confusing, a lot of emotional baggage. While on Risperdal, I was sluggish, moody, not wanting to do anything, depressed. Like I said, memory loss was a big thing tremors in my hands, and just not feeling right, not feeling correct, not feeling the way I felt during my life. And this pertains strictly to Risperdal, he said. While on the vitamins, for the most part I feel uppity, active, wanting to learn things, spending time with family members, being able to retain what I read better, to put it in one word, just better, more complete. I'll share three quotes from Dale about these phases. So. To reflect his, he, he had particularly negative experiences with psychiatrists, and I think this may partly have been due to the fact that he's highly intelligent, and he asked difficult questions about why he was being prescribed the drugs he was, and he brought up orthomolecular medicine, and so it's possible that he kind of created more sense of threat, and the relationship with the psychiatrist ended very in a hostile way. He, he said, in describing a particular experience, I would get a lot of, lots of anxiety talking to my psychiatrist. I would have to breathe heavily to calm myself down, and he saw this as me being sick. So he kept saying, you're not well, you're not well. And I told him, I'm experiencing anxiety right now. I don't like being interviewed in here. And it was like a teaching hospital, so students were observing this. At the same time, he's questioning me. It was really quite awful. Regarding his time while taking Risperdal, I lost a lot of functioning, I was very tired, I wasn't able to concentrate, it was devastating. It was crippling. I barely found the ability to focus on a book, I could barely read, I could barely write. My confidence was totally shattered, my ability to be social was totally disrupted, he said. And one more quote I'll share is Dale's account of what happened when he introduced the orthomolecular treatment. I was getting mood swings where I would be unexplainably moody. I would be very irritable. The smallest things that are totally understandable would be very irritating for me. It was unexplained. There would be no reason for it. And I would experience a day out of the week where I would have really low mood and really not be motivated and apathetic. All of that stopped once I was on the orthomolecular treatment. My mood stabilized. I feel more clear. I'm not having these episodes of irritability. So, interpreting what the interviews, interviews yielded, I have studied transpersonal psychology, and therefore that's the lens that I bring into this, and I think there is a potential alliance between orthomolecular medicine and transpersonal psychology primarily because of the non-pathologizing view 
of schizophrenia and many conditions. According to orthomolecular medicine, schizophrenia can be cured and, and in fact the body will rectify itself if fed properly, if given what it needs. And there seems to be much less stigma in this philosophy of the condition because there's to say that I have a malnourished brain is much less, brings about less shame than to say something like I have a broken brain or my brain is malfunctioning. Transpersonal psychology, this field of psychology that emerged in the 70s with the intent to honor the whole spectrum of human experience. And scholars of transpersonal psychology have, have articulated the concept of spiritual emergency, which is the idea that in moments of significant growth in our life, disorder may be necessary in order for a higher order to manifest. And that's an emergency when, when a person appears to go mad or have symptoms of intense emotional upheavals or bizarre thinking. It's quite possible that this is a disorder occurring in the service of higher order and of evolution of the individual. And so this is obviously non-pathologizing and in fact is quite growth oriented and may even make a person feel like, oh, I'm very fortunate to have this condition because there's growth potential in it. The symptoms at diagnosis are pretty unclear. I can gather them only from the stories I heard because I didn't have the psychiatrist's account of that. But it definitely seemed like, I, I understand now through covering the literature and through interviewing these people that schizophrenia is a broad construct. And there are many, many symptoms that constitute this construct. And I think this study challenges the idea that one single chemical process, for example, faulty dopamine transmission, could ever explain the variety of symptoms that constitute schizophrenia. Risperdal, the basic mechanism of it is dopamine inhibition, and that's the basic mechanism of most antipsychotic drugs. And we, it's, it's very clear in the literature that the adverse effects of Risperdal are can be devastating. The largest study of antipsychotics done, clinical antipsychotic trials of intervention efficacy, the Katy study, 70% of the people in that study, of about 1,500 people, stopped using the antipsychotic due to adverse effects within an 18-month period which was a finding that I don't think anyone expected, and perhaps some people did not like, but it's, it's so significant that 70% of that large of a sample discontinued the use of the drug due to adverse effects, and the reports from these individuals corroborate that evidence. I, I inserted the final sentence of my dissertation in here, and I'll read it out loud. The case histories suggest that schizophrenia can catalyze evolution in individuals supported with the right molecules and a validating growth-oriented spiritual context in which to interpret their experiences. Ramifications for future research, much needs to be done. Regarding the orthomolecular treatment, it's very important that we develop the technology to detect with far greater accuracy how deficient someone is in what particular vitamins. So that developing that technology is critical. If I were to do this study over again, one thing I would do differently and something I would suggest to future researchers is to document the diet of the individuals much more closely. <clears throat> I would do that if I could again. 
because if if there's a deficiency in a particular vitamin that is obviously coming from a deficiency in the diet. So understanding the diet be better is important to understanding this whole picture. And although I tried, I would try harder to get the interviews with the psychiatrists. That would have that would have really strengthened these findings. So they, you know, to future researchers, I would say do your best and securing those interviews and that's about it actually so I feel complete I'm trying to keep this time efficient so I'm ready to move to the next phase of question asking if anyone has any thanks very much uh, Nick that was a good concise presentation of your, of your main findings mm -hmm. so um, Yes, why don't we move on to uh, questions or aspects uh, that the committee members would like to ask, but you're also welcome to ask any questions you'd like. Uh, perhaps we could ask Dr. Saul first um, to see what he has to say. I feel a little less connected since he's online. I want to be sure he gets his full time and presence shared here. Yes, thanks. We've got all our That's here for technology. <laughs> I appreciate um, all that Nick has done. This is a very tricky area because so much of it is generally classed as anecdotal. And most people that use niacin, most doctors that use niacin, and most reports using niacin are clinical reports, doctor reports, patient reports, case histories, or just plain out and out testimonials. I think there's high validity there, and at the same time, you don't have the usual level of scientific rigor there by definition. It's very difficult to study things with multiple variables, as everybody knows. And when you consider the varieties, uh, as Nick said, the varieties of nutrients or non-nutrients that people eat during the day, and at this point, even the sheer number of medications that people take during the day, many of which are not even prescribed, it becomes unbelievably complicated. A good example of this is the Gerson cancer therapy. That's the famous one with the raw juices and, of course, the body temperature coffee enemas, which oncologists are not uniformly in support of. Now, there's a long track record on that therapy, but there's just as much controversy, and it's almost impossible to study scientifically because, one, everybody's different. Two, it claims to work on many different types of cancer. And three, the number of variables are, are huge because the protocol calls for maybe 12 different interventions. So Nick really has his uh, work cut out for him here. Hoffer and colleagues, notably uh, uh, Osmond, Humphrey Osmond, and uh, Smythes and some others, tried to narrow this down by doing the first double-blind placebo-controlled studies on any nutrient in the history of psychiatry in the early 50s. And I think Nick has captured that uh, very well. The problem is that because this was done so long ago, that there is sort of a, a general feeling that maybe that research was not rigorous or perhaps uh, more modern research would be better for whatever reason uh, it might be. But the problem then is it's very difficult to get the research done. A, a physician in California, um, Bob Cathcart, and I were talking about this, and Cathcart, who's a specialist orthopedic surgeon, mentioned that if you try to get vitamin studies done, you're up against this assumption, whether it's stated or whether it's just a belief, that you're busting the safe upper limits. And to give you an idea, uh, Nick mentioned the patient or patients that used 11,000 milligrams of niacin, 11 grams a day, and 30 grams or 30,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. Now, the safe upper limit for niacin is under 40. And the safe upper limit for vitamin C is not much over 2,000. So if you go to an, uh, an IRB or, or any, anyone at all and say, I want to do experiments with uh, an order of magnitude or two higher than 
uh, the safe upper limit, you can see what happens. So this discourages a lot of research here as well, not to mention that um, there is money made by selling vitamins. The pharmaceutical industry makes most vitamin powders, powders and concentrates, but this represents uh, less than 1% of their involvement in medicine. So when you put all this together, it's really tricky. Um, I have the following suggestions, that, and these are going to be pretty specific. Mm -hmm. Um, one is uh, the um, work by uh, Jonathan Prowski. Mm -hmm. Can you mention Jonathan? Uh, very important. He's a professor of naturopathic medicine up at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. He's very interested in the effect of niacin on the benzodiazepine receptors, and there has been a lot of focus on the dopamine receptors. Mm -hmm. But uh, Prowski's work uh, has been um, suggesting that niacin actually works like a benzodiazepine which is interesting, if not, if not fascinating. Um, the American Association of Poison Control Centers has indicated no demonstrated deaths from niacin in the last 31 years. So the safety of niacin has is, is actually been confirmed by a national coast to coast uh, database in 59 poison control studies reported. Your study is an N equals 2 study. I've seen papers published with N equals 1. If it's plausible, I think it's worth pursuing, mm -hmm. but I don't have to tell you how difficult it is when you have such a small sample. Mm -hmm. And you told us how difficult it was to get even the small sample. Mm -hmm. And you were working against this, and to the extent that you were able to overcome that, I think uh, you deserve a pat on the back and no mistake. Um, remember um, the discussion you have of the adrenochrome hypothesis, uh, I think is very well done. Most people don't know much about it. You reduced it very tidily, uh, showing that it was the oxidation that makes this stuff toxic and may, in fact, be a trigger for schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. There is unbelievable controversy over this. The adrenochrome hypothesis has never been widely accepted. Dr. Hoffer, whom I knew personally and worked with and attended meetings with and corresponded with and wrote four books with, Dr. Hoffer, to the end of his life, stuck by his guns on the adrenochrome hypothesis. Krausky is suggesting that it might not be adrenochrome at all, but again, it might be that nice and works on the events of diazepine receptors. You, there's a newer reference for Parsons. You have Parsons, 1964. Parsons was the Mayo Clinic researcher who said that liver enzyme elevation does not indicate liver pathology. It indicates liver activity. Mm -hmm. Parsons' newer book uh, is 2000, and uh, it's called Cholesterol Control Without Diet. It is obviously not aiming at the use of niacin in psychiatry, but Parsons, being a Mayo Clinic researcher with a lot of experience, was able to independently confirm that niacin is very safe. So you get an increase in what may, many people call liver function tests, but that increase is normally within a modest amount, and, and Dr. Parsons um, claimed and backed up the idea that that was pretty um, pretty harmless. Mm -hmm. okay. Those are some of my comments, and uh, is there something that I can contribute in addition? I do have a question for you, but I think I'll wait until a later phase of this meeting, if that's okay. So for now, that, yes, was, great. that was great, thank you. Guys, well, I, um, I'm going to like maybe end up shifting a little bit, uh, uh, and uh, ask you, you know, how, why schizophrenia? Because, you know, you, you talked about the inspiration coming from what you saw happening with your mother, mm -hmm. but that was, uh, it was not, that was not schizophrenia, it was uh, medical conditions. Right. And so, uh, what drew you to schizophrenia? Because, you know, even on the face of it, it's a very, nebulous, complex, etc., etc., and they, one could even ask something that you did not, you know, whether it really is a medical condition. Right. Yeah. To be totally honest, the main reason was because there was enough evidence to write a literature review. There was enough evidence for the orthomolecular treatment in schizophrenia to write a literature review. That was, mm -hmm. truthfully, the reason that I pursued it. Then there were other other reasons that supported that decision. So so you don't have like an intrinsic interest in schizophrenia? 
I do now. You do now. <laughs> I sure do now. Well, you may I proceed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I already said to you that uh, that you know I don't find fault with you not uh, looking into the non-medical, non-brain mm -hmm. aspects, uh, but. But I think if you have an intrinsic interest in this, first of all, there's plenty of research tradition, and especially clinical tradition, but the, and the research in the earlier years tended to be you know, of a clinical nature rather than experimental or statistical. Mm -hmm. But now, of course, there's more of that too, of, uh, of uh, people who go back all the way, not exactly to Freud, because Freud decided schizophrenics cannot be, you know, analyzed, you know. But uh, subsequent uh, people who studied looking at, including in an anthropologist, you know, who studied looking at the, the social uh, dimensions, uh, and in, uh, especially focusing on the family dynamics, you know. And, uh, and so, uh, first of all, in general, I would think that, you know, if you are not so fond of the medical model, this would be a, a more holistic way of looking at a person rather than just their brain. You know, what do they go through in life, starting from the beginning? And, and so, so I'm just sort of like, uh, I, I have to confess that reading the, the vignettes, uh, or the case, uh, you know, the, the uh, experiences that you reported and who was reporting what, uh, I couldn't help but see some of the family dynamics. They were more glaring in the case of Bob, mm -hmm. but but I was intrigued about what they might be in the case of Dale. Mm -hmm. And let me just mention that you know uh, you, you have a mother in the case of Bob who is on the one hand extremely involved and and essentially sort of identified with the son and controlling his experience. Mm -hmm. You know, she's is, is essentially kind of almost like determining what he's experiencing and what he, who he is, what he is, like this super, super smart kid, etc. But uh, so on the one hand, there's that. She's right there with all of this treatment and all of what it means. And then on the other hand, she leaves the kid, <laughs> you know, just leaves him. You know, and one wonders uh, uh, whether this kind, of, this kind of dynamic was put, playing throughout the child. Most likely, it was because she somehow didn't think uh, that there's uh, any real danger or if, that this is a critical situation. She's abandoning her kid. You know, so I suspect that she lacks a certain kind of whatever. You know, I'm speculating. Yeah, right. And and then on the other hand. Uh, wanting to kind of, she was eagerly seizing on any kind of sort of medical to concretize, you know, what was going on in terms that would not implicate her and her relationship with her son, like attributing one of his breakdowns to Xanax, a small dose of Xanax, you know, <laughs> and as a one example, so, yeah. so that the, the that it's clear that she has, if, if nothing else, you know, attachment theory focuses on this aspect, and, and it's a very inconsistent, like sort of like like uh, confusing attachment. And this is actually a very typical thing that I have found mm -hmm. in uh, you know in my clinical experience. Mm -hmm. I'm yet to find in my limited clinical experience. Of course, it's very limited. Or a little more than that cases uh, where there wasn't something weird going on in the family dynamics. That's why I was intrigued by the case of Dale because that wasn't evident. You know, but, but I would like to know more. You know. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, the reason why I'm bringing this out is that if you have an intrinsic interest in the schizophrenia, then you might look into this this kind of uh, like uh, tradition. Yes. It's not uh, in so uh, you know transpersonal psychology provides an overall framework that is friendlier because it doesn't pathologize, but it doesn't really provide a way of working with someone. You know, but there are traditions. That
thank you very much for that perspective. <laughs> and yeah, I, interestingly, um, after doing the interviews and writing the results chapter, I went a certain route with interpreting the results, which involved, I read The Psychology of Dementia Praecox by Jung, and attempted to interpret these experiences using his language and kind of in light of his theory. And then Jenny was like, no. <laughs> but it was, yeah. it was important that I didn't, because I wasn't versed enough, of course, in, in the many traditions. But all to say, it definitely sparked my interest about the psychology and not just the physiology of the condition. Yeah. And maybe, yeah. maybe I'll contact you about some resources and you can guide me a little bit in, just from my own learning or okay wonderful thank you well, but yeah if you're living in this area there's you know there, there's some of that happening right here uh -huh. it, it is fairly rare because now everybody is into the medical model uh -huh. but san francisco is one of the few spots on the continent also. Well, I was struck by um, the, the, getting back to Kaiser's point about the, the mother's comment that well, he'd been weird since birth, mm -hmm. you know, and wondering again about how much of that's her attachment problem and how much of that was really something, mm -hmm. and whether there was, uh, especially if we're talking about a vitamin deficiency or maybe a metabolic disorder, whether there was something really present that you know, was throwing uh, behavioral, the behavior off in a grossly observable way simply because there was some kind of uh, either vitamin deficiency or an inability to metabolize certain foods properly. Um, another, just not necessarily for something for you to respond to, but that came to mind here uh, with your case histories is that when these your two people's behavior got so bizarre and some of them were taking drugs or other kinds of self-medication or their lives were just spinning out of control, even if they'd had uh, a stable environment where they were relatively well nourished by just conventional standards, it sounds like their diets got out of control along with everything else in their lives and they were probably eating junk food uh, or and you know not not consuming a good a good diet anyway, and when you see the, the people who go off Risperdal or who are loose on the streets, who are psychotic, you know, eating God only knows what kind of food, it made me wonder about uh, street level interventions, you know, at soup kitchens or places like that where they sort of catch some of these people, cannot admit them necessarily, but whether there would be something at a more social level, a kind of education that would change the diet of, you know, of people who are obviously psychotic if they go into places like that where they're given some kind of free nutrition that might help them. I realize they have to take it over an extended period. And these are people who are not likely to keep to a schedule, but it just raised a lot of very interesting questions for me about many of the people who are not, uh, who's, Psychosis is not controlled at all um, because they're not they're not caught by the system in any in any given way. Um, I and I also wondered, uh, and maybe Dr. Saul knows the answer. Does Risperdal or do some of the other pharmaceuticals leach uh, some of these uh, nutrients from the food that people take? Is that a, is that a side effect of mm. some of these, uh, some of the other drugs? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Do you, Dr. Saul? You know your. We, your we don't audio. have audio. We don't have audio. Mm. There it is. Uh, it's possible. It's common for a drug to interact with the nutrients and the nutrient intake or utilization or washout of the body. It's possible for nutrients to interfere with drugs, but it's much more common for drugs to interfere with nutrients, so it's not unheard of. I think the real point here is um, that Hoffer was constantly talking about and 
nutrient dependency, not a nutrient deficiency. And I have gotten more people correcting me, in quotes, on my books and other writings because I said dependency and they thought, well, didn't you mean deficiency? A deficiency would be you need, say, 16 milligrams of niacin a day and you're getting 10. Now, you could say that person is niacin deficient. But if you had a person who looks at the RDA and only looks at the RDA, they would say that taking 50 milligrams of niacin a day is a megadose. Now, Hoffer never used much less than 3,000 milligrams a day, occasionally less, especially with children. But 3,000 was his benchmark prescription, 1,000 milligrams three times a day. And in many cases, he used twice that. And you've already seen cases, and the one that I reported on in the Food Matters movie was also 11,000. And the person with established schizophrenia is going to need far, far more. A person that has just recently been doing schizophrenia is going to need less. So you have the same disease, and then you have different people, different duration, different diets, mm -hmm. and there's so many confounding factors in there. It's very difficult. So the odds of the drug interfering with a high dose of niacin would probably be uh, fairly trivial. Mm -hmm. But the odds of a drug dealing with a person who has a borderline diet might be crucial. In other words, if you're a millionaire and you lose a $100 bill, you're not going to worry about it. And if all you have to live on and feed the family for a week is $100, it's a whole different story. So nutritional inadequacy is probably the real problem. I'm not in favor of medication for treat this, but Dr. Hoffer was very strong on telling people that initially, at least, medication was often necessary and wise because you have to stabilize people in a hurry. What he objected to was medication without nutrition and or long-term medication where the person needs more and more and more to get the same result. And the more they take, the worse the side effects. So I'm, I'm trying to answer the question without dodging it, but I have to recast it because dose is really the key. If you were to study if Risperdal knocks out nutrients in most people taking normal standard American diets, I'm sure you could show that it does. But you could also show more clearly that a schizophrenic is, is niacin dependent and whether they take Risperdal or not is almost beside the point. Because you can take the Risperdal and then take a huge amount of niacin. And what will happen is that the person will need less Risperdal. They might still need it. They might need something else. They might need some other medication. But Dr. Hoffer was adamant about this, that by using nutrition and drugs together, you're going to find out what really works the best, and it's highly individualized. His point of view was, yes, in fact, I disagreed with him when I first met him. I thought he was kind of a, a little bit too friendly towards the use of electroconvulsive shock and, uh, and medication. But he explained it, saying that when someone's in dire straits, you do have to do certain things right away. But you give them the nutrition, and the nutrition's effect is long-term. He said drugs long-term are almost always a failure. And nutrition long-term is more likely to be a success, especially if you give enough. It's very difficult to track this. And there hasn't been a lot of study done to see just how bad is risk for all. <laughs> uh, we have so many people on medications now, and the assumption is that if they get the RDA, you don't really have to worry about it. Well, the dependency theory is that like Japanese prisoner of war camp um, soldiers that came back to Canada after World War II, Hoffer found that about half of them did very well when they were just given good diet and modest amounts of niacin. But he found the other half or so needed unbelievably large amounts of niacin to stabilize them. So they had a dependency. And since Dr. Hoffer uh, believed, and so did Harry Foster and, and uh, Smithies and Osman and the others, that schizophrenia is biochemical, and that is, it, it is a vitamin dependency. Now we have to look at 1,000 milligram doses 
against whether Risperdal or another drug might knock out a few milligrams. So I guess I'm trying to shift the priority back over to the high dose that Hoffa recommended. If somebody ate at McDonald's every day and took a lot of niacin, they would do better treating schizophrenia than if they ate at a health food restaurant and did not take niacin. That does not mean McDonald's food is good. It does not mean health food is bad. It simply means that what they really need is niacin. And Hoffer insisted that it was the niacin that did it. He felt the other nutrients were important. He had a PhD in serial biochemistry, so he knew all about the vitamins for sure. Plus, he was an MD. Plus, he was a board-certified psychiatrist and director of research for a Canadian province. And he insisted that this was specifically a niacin issue and specifically a high-dose niacin issue. To him, the use of the medication was not a major plus or minus as long as the high dose of niacin was also there. Does that sort of answer the question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Hoffer was an astonishing person. I, I was very fortunate to be able to actually uh, work with him. And uh, it's funny, people used to say to him, uh, Abram, you, your patients are getting better because uh, really you have such a nice bedside manner. And Dr. Hoffer said, well, I, I'm, I'm nice to everybody, but only the people that take nice and get better. <laughs> That's a nice thought. <laughs> Thank you. It wasn't his bedside manner. It was actually the biochemical effects of nice. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick, I wanted to ask you, um, you had a clear motivation for going into this study that you shared with us, I mean, that started some time back, um, and I'm just wondering how you've changed as a result of what you've, not just what you've learned, but really how doing this process has, has changed you, going through all the rigors of the dissertation process, but also what you found. Yeah. Well, I have, I have become a researcher. <laughs> I have become a researcher and I embrace the skill set that I've de been developing with your close mentorship and I have come to see research as as a means for knowledge like in Indian traditions they have the word pramanas a valid means for knowledge and I consider good research as a valid means for knowledge and so I've just you know, this, this has been a very multi-dimensional experience during this dissertation because it involved envisioning, it involved reading, it involved thinking and writing and interacting with human beings and then adapting to adversity and so all that I was challenged with made me stronger in those specific ways, yeah, especially in understanding validity, in understanding how a study, how you can be sure that the conclusions that you draw are valid. And, and it's in, we're in an era and culture where people tend to believe anything that follows the phrase, studies show. So I consider this skill set of being able to analyze studies and, and create them and conduct them incredibly valuable yeah so that's that's a very specific way that i've grown in terms of answering some of the questions that you came into this with you know the challenge that was posed by your mother's death mm -hmm. and so forth um have you drawn have you found answers for that or for some of those larger more existential or transpersonal issues mm -hmm. in going through this particularly around suffering, uh, clearly with the, the people that you were talking to in the past that they were on, they had a particular way of doing it, but you know, you had a situation in your own life that ended in a different way. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a big question. And I, this has been a, a direct look at suffering. And I'm inspired and I'm so grateful and I'll probably write thank you letters to my participants because I learned so much from them about the fruits of suffering, about what facing a difficult emotion can lead to. 
And so, I guess, and I'm surprised to be saying this right now, but I guess I have come through this slightly less afraid of my own suffering. <laughs> and almost, maybe even, um, ready. Ready for what suffering is going to bubble up and, and, and what it's going to take to get through it and what's going to come of it. So now we can tell you you have to rewrite the whole thing. <laughs> 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 I, I couldn't handle that. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a really good place to, to end things. Mm -hmm. Would you like to ask any questions? Okay. Jasmine, Just welcome. Oh, hi. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. Um, well, then, any comments, uh, so, you know, about changes or anything that we require for uh, for Nick's draft if we kind of segue into a more critical Mm -hmm. aspect. I know you've already gotten significant comments from Kaiza and I don't know if you want to respond to those here with us as a group and I don't know if Dr. Small sent you other things in addition to the rubric mm -hmm. that I saw. Mm -hmm. So we should discuss any changes that we think would be a good idea to your draft. Okay. And and just know that I wouldn't be offended if you left at any point just because <laughs> now we're getting into some details. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to turn this up because I wrote down wrote down some, some questions. Um, and I, I think I'll start with my questions for you, Kaisa. I was so grateful for your thorough feedback. It was so obvious to me that you read everything closely. You two remind me of each other, actually. You said you we were friends. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, <laughs> um, Ties us together. So you you brought up the the point that I agree with, which is that my bias is clear to see when you're reading through. And on one hand, I felt like I wasn't I wasn't trying to hide it necessarily, but on the other hand, I don't want it to be. I don't, I don't want anyone to say, well, he's interpreting these things because of his bias. So I'm, I, I would like to tweak language where I can to just neutralize it. And I appreciated your specific examples of, of when I was speaking in biased language. And so, I, let's see, one question I have is, or one, I guess, assessment of it in that vein is, I did notice that I was more critical of the disconfirming studies than I was of the confirming studies. So the question, it might even be kind of rhetorical, but sh would it help to go back and maybe be a little bit more critical of those confirming studies and yeah, point out more methodological limitations? Yeah, or, or even to make more modest sort of like conclusions uh -huh. from them, uh -huh. you know, because, you know, as a sort of reader, you know, sort of like talking about the bias that I felt was mm -hmm. that you kind of uh, 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 concluded more than was warranted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, by, by the, uh, the studies, given, given the sort of like the qualifications that need to be made uh -huh. in light of this, this, this. Yes. Know? Yeah. And so, so that would be, you know, the, the, uh, I think that, you know, my, my uh, sort of like interest in this is uh, since you're going to be researching maybe topics that are not sort of um, already sort of like, uh, uh, like in the mainstream acceptance, uh -huh. it becomes even more important to not sound biased, yeah. but rather to be, to, uh, to be able to sort of take like account for you know like deal with and acknowledge yeah. everything that that you know that, you know it's all the the valid criticisms mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, so so it's a kind of I don't know you know it's not so much a method but but almost like sort of cultivating a kind of a way of being with all this and sort of thinking of your audience as being the ones who don't agree with you mm -hmm. how will you persuade them? I find for myself to be the best 
guide. You know, okay, I'm here to persuade people who are not, well, obviously not agreeing with me. So what's the best way to do that? That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's you know, it's being generous mm -hmm. about the validity of the points that they make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then right. you can easily say. Yeah. 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 I see. Yeah. yeah. Which I could probably afford to do in the APA's assessment of the orthomolecular treatment, I can probably be a little bit more generous about mm -hmm. the validity of their criticisms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Uh -huh. That makes sense. And it's sort of like, like it's okay to, to sort of like not have such a kind of su su superlative conclusions. Uh -huh. because, I mean, not, uh, the very nature of this kind of research doesn't ever lend itself because there are no, I mean, there's hardly any subject and, and uh, so about this. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, emphasize that uh, that this is a very difficult area to do research that would meet all the ideal criteria. So it, there's always going to be questions that can be asked. Mm -hmm. That okay, what about this? And so it's good to kind of acknowledge it, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and and still bring bring in what what can be. And and you know, I don't know. I think uh, like an openness. Uh, I was, I was thinking the funny thing is that just uh, uh, maybe about three uh, weeks ago or uh, most a month ago, I get this weekly science news. You know, it sort of digests uh, what are the latest interesting in all the different fields, including psychology, but uh, astronomy and so on as well. And there, there was a headline article they, the, that there was some new nutrient but I forgot what it is that uh, that now is like uh, like uh, like apparently some studies have been done that is very potent in in uh, in uh, so sort of in uh, re removing the symptoms of schizophrenia uh -huh. so so you know in, in this research has focused on niacin but if you think of all the nutrients that we could be deficient in or dependent you know I mean, uh, the, 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 you know, there's a whole, you know, it opens the field more mm -hmm. rather than, okay, it's got to be nice. Right. Yeah. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, the elephant in the room is, it's, what is schizophrenia? It's, mm -hmm. it's yeah. just, I, I, you know, studied every edition of the DSM. And it has changed in every one, and even mm -hmm. still, with the supposedly stricter criteria, they it's such a variety. Everything See, from... That's the last place I would go to. <laughs> yeah, I won't go there. That right, question. that's a good point. I won't yeah. go there. But it's yeah. just... Yeah. I'll to say, like, I, I see why nothing, no bold statements can be made about it. Yeah. So specifically, you pointed out the conclusions that I made at the end of the literature review about the orthomolecular studies. And I looked at them, and, and I agree. I think there's one or two quotes that I put in at the end, which I can delete. Mm -hmm. And one was about, I quoted someone saying, actually, one was Dr. Saul's, no offense, because you're probably, it's probably true, but the quote that offers so many scientific studies and so many number of cases cured has yet to convince orthodox medicine. And I was thinking, OK, if I'm someone in orthodox medicine, I would be very offended and turned off by that comment, I yeah, guess. Yeah. So so maybe that's one that I can remove. Yeah. And then there's another one about, I quoted someone who was talking about how many studies Hopper did, but I didn't actually cover that many studies. So I can remove that quote too. Mm -hmm. I think that would sober it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll add something in case you uh, want to do more interview studies, uh, you know, people, I mean, the uh, medical profession is probably even worse than the, the, uh, uh, the other mental health professions in, in sort of like becoming more and more sort of like fear-based, like, uh, like always concerned about something that I think the, uh, there's an almost official term for it, CYA, mm -hmm. cover your ass. I reason why I forgive my language, but you know, when I was studying for licensure, you know, in California, the, like the ethics part that I had to retake here, you know, and I was listening to these um, uh, seminars, you know, like uh, that prepared you for it, and the, the instructor was using this term, and somebody asked, what does that mean? You see, and then she explained, 
That's what it means. And, and, and so all these psychiatrists are very worried about, about uh, somebody reporting them to the board or something like that, you know, uh, if, the, if they are using unorthodox, uh, you know, medicine. I'm not saying that they shouldn't. It's just that they are in fear. Yeah. And the other uh, sort of issue is confidentiality. It's very difficult to, to uh, first of all, to do research on patients, mm -hmm. you know, and then to get some uh, some of their caregivers, psychiatrists, to agree mm -hmm. to that, to, to have their name associated. It's going to be really hard, not just uh, uh, because of the molecular, you know, approach, but with any. Yeah, there was just one other thing which, which you brought up about um, in the APA's assessment of orthomolecular treatment, they criticized the lack of uniformity in, in the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, that's a, a criticism that I can be more generous and give more validity to, I think, and point out that that lack of un uniformity befell all studies, yes. drugs yes. and vitamins yes. and everything, yes. because it's the construct. So that was an excellent point. Thank you for making it, and I'll, I'll add that class. Yeah. I'm, I'm satisfied, you know. I okay, mean, you yeah. Know, sort of make these bigger points just to, in case you are interested in pursuing it. Okay. And since I passed the draft, obviously yes. I don't, didn't have any major changes, but I certainly concur with the ones that Kaiser listed. And then I'd be interested to know if there was anything else that Dr. Saul said uh, to you uh, in addition to the rubrics that uh, needs, needs change. As, as far as I understood your feedback that you sent me, Dr. Saul, there weren't many su suggested changes, right? But you, you did offer me other ways that I could support the conclusions that I was making after the literature review. And for example, you talked about what you kind of touched on today, the importance of looking at dose in the disconfirming studies. And so I had, I had the question of, should I include what you, what you suggested, like those quotes from Dr. Cathcart that you suggested, if your sense was that I should include them in the dissertation, or just good to be aware of? Well, I think it's important enough to have mentioned it today and also to have sent it to you previously. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I'm not sure that it would necessarily be something you'd want to put in as the quote. Uh, particularly if you're trying to find a neutral tone. Uh, the key here is that in any study, whether it's of a drug or a vitamin, dose has to be looked at very carefully. And I have often looked at papers that challenge the effectiveness. A good example would be of vitamin C for viruses. And it's just astonishing how many of those studies use what an orthomolecular physician would consider to be an ineffective low dose, but the researchers claimed was a mega dose. I see. And then when you look at the number, you find out the amount of vitamin C they gave was 500 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams. Mm -hmm. And that's five to 12 times the RDA. So it is a mega dose. It's not a false statement. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a conspiracy here. I don't think there's uh, anything that can't be overcome with the facts. But the problem is, if you use the word megadose or high dose, you, it always has to be quantified. Uh -huh. So I think any study quoted on niacin, whether it worked or whether it didn't, should include the total daily dose, mm -hmm. regardless. Yes. And then the reader can decide. Yeah. If you find studies at 3,000 milligrams or more of niacin a day that did not show effectiveness, that is a very powerful criticism of Hoffer and Osmond. Right. But if you find a study with 500 milligrams a day that then 
takes off after Hoffer and Osman, well, it's not a replication. Right. And that's just so obvious uh, that you would think everybody would know it, but they don't know it mm -hmm. if the writer has not clearly stated dose. And what you often find is this is buried in the paper. Mm -hmm. It's not in the abstract. Mm -hmm. It's not in the conclusion. It's, it's buried in there. And you have to really look hard to find out how much of a vitamin they gave. Yeah. And you have to look even harder to find out how often they gave it. And with water-soluble vitamins in general, and niacin in particular, if you don't divide the dose, it's not going to work very well. So Hoffer gave 1,000 milligrams or more three times a day. So I think the dose thing is of paramount importance. No matter whether you're proving that it works or proving that it doesn't, you see, you can be completely neutral and just tell the truth, uh -huh. which Mark Twain said will gratify some and astonish the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So I think uh, it's very, very important to keep hitting on the dose. And this is probably my, my major suggestion of all. The second thing that I mentioned in, in my comments to you that I'd like to, to share uh, now as well is that um, Dr. Hoffer specifically said niacin or niacinamide is therapeutic for schizophrenia. And he made that very clear. He based it on uh, pellagra, he based it on his clinical experience, he based it on the chemistry, he based it on the double-blind placebo-controlled studies. And he was extremely specific that no, uh, Freud was right, that you can't use therapy, uh, talk therapy or counseling or anything like analysis to deal with a biochemical problem. And Hoffer was adamant that the the issue here was niacin for schizophrenia. Other nutrients are important, but he mentioned specifically a, a focus on, on niacin. Uh, he also gave other nutrients, and this, uh, again, confounds it, because someone would say, well, Dr. Hoffer, you claimed it was just a niacin, but if we take a look at your protocol, you also gave three to 8,000 milligrams of vitamin C. Wouldn't that stop the oxidation of adrenaline? And the answer is yes. And Hoffer acknowledged that. And then he said, well, you also told your patients not to eat sugar. Wouldn't that also reduce symptoms bordering on psychosis in some sensitive people? And the answer is yes. Well, Dr. Hoffer, you also advocated a whole food diet, a good nutrient diet, and also other vitamins. And wouldn't that be a benefit to a schizophrenic or someone who isn't? And the answer is yes. So you see how, how muddy it gets. Yeah. And that's why I think the only safe um, boulder to hold on to is the dose of niacin use because you can't possibly eliminate all the other variables, but you can find the ones where they did or did not use the Hoffer amount of niacin. Okay. So I consider that to be uh, the most important single thing that uh, I want you to, to address. You're never going to get through all the confounding variables. and. I think it's safe to say that challenging bias head-on is probably not the way to go, and I think you know that, and I think the committee would agree. In fact, it might even be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that works, and this is what I've done for 40 years now, is I always go back to the doctors that get clinical results and mention the dose they used. And then I went to people and picked up their own mind. Mm -hmm. The big surprise is, that people are getting doses of three to 11,000 milligrams of niacin a day when the safe upper limit is under 40. And there's almost no discussion of that at all. And that's why your paper is so interesting because it does recap the story. And I think you do a commendable job of it. Uh, I think you might be a little bit light on the biochemistry. You might want to go into just a little bit more of how Hoffer felt the niacin worked. Mm -hmm. I think you might want to introduce the deficiency versus dependency idea. But the, the number one point is always compare doses. If I'm going to buy a lot more, uh, I can, uh, they all have different features. But if I know for a fact that all lawnmowers under $300 are, have lousy consumer reports rating, and the only one that's any good is 450 <laughs> I'm wasting my time without spending 300 if 450 will do it. In the same way that if someone wants to buy a house that costs a third of a million dollars, they're not going to get it for 5,000 bucks no matter how good a negotiator they are. 
And this is approaching the level, the order of magnitude disparity in research. So you really want to look at the dose, and I would quote the dose. Mm -hmm. That will relieve you of the obligation that you may feel morally, or the caution that is um, necessarily involved with an academic paper. And you can avoid bias one way or the other, simply by putting the dose out there, along with your reference and, and the rest of the citation. Okay. So that would be the one thing I would like to emphasize, I would like to see you do okay. throughout the paper. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, those changes all sound, you know, fairly straightforward and easy for you to make. So, I think that we're in agreement in approving your dissertation Absolutely. with these with these changes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for, for Dr. Fortuna. Oh wow. <laughs> 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that sounds uh, good. Yeah. Okay. So, is there anything anyone else would like to add? I think we're complete on what you need to do, and with the signed rubrics, I believe, Heidi, I have, yeah, which we'll all forward to you, uh, with my signature on them, um, then we're, we're complete okay. for the process. Would either of you two like to see the final revised version of Nick's paper with, with the changes in it. If not, I'll just look at it and, and before it goes into its final version. So it's up to you. I don't need to see it. I look forward to seeing a published paper mm -hmm. with a really cool neutral stance with all the facts and, and the dosage <laughs> laid out. Yeah. Okay. Nick, I would like either to see the corrected paper, or if you prefer, you could just send me a digest of the corrections on a separate sheet, if that wouldn't be too much trouble. Sure. I'll do that. I, I'm, I could, I'm specifically talking about dose. I'd like to see where, where you introduce the doses, whatever way is easier for you, whether it's sending me the whole paper or whether you just want to do a, a list out on the side. I would very much like to see that, and otherwise I have complete, um, again, unconditional approval. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all, committee members, yes, thank and you. thank you, Nick. This has really yes. been a satisfying and very rewarding experience for me. So I just want to express my appreciation for your scholarship uh, and the wonderful attitude of inquiry and appreciation that you demonstrated throughout this process, whether it was how, you know, relating to the participants in the study relating to the rest of us on the committee, and particularly your response to critical feedback. Um, you're like my ideal student mm. to work with, and I just want to express my appreciation for how professional this relationship has always been because of the, the talents and the attitude that you brought to it. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, I can see why you would say all you know, that just based on what I have seen today, I really could. Thank you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a question. What's next? What's next? That's what I'm saying. You just got your doctorate. Just what are you going to do next? <laughs> Champagne all around. Yeah. Yeah. I'm moving my car so I don't get a ticket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all worried about that. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Saul. You, you certainly added an enormous uh, value to this. I, it's just been a pleasure to have you on the committee and helping point Nick to all, so many resources. This was really great. That's very kind of you. I wish Dr. Humphrey um, could have taken this himself, but he died some years ago. Mm. So I'm just standing in for, for what he did. Um, mm. My father said, when you want to know something, go for the organ grinder, not the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> but in this particular case, yeah. in this particular case, I'm glad to be able to stand in for him. And uh, I think Nick's work is very interesting. And I hope you publish this. Uh, Nick, have you given that some thought? Yeah, I, I, I in fact plan to message you about that and maybe get some guidance around condensing it into an article form. 
So yes. All right, and is this acceptable to the school? Is this something that has to wait for a while? Uh, oh, no, no, no. No. Just... no, he's ready. He can he's go. Ready. He can go. Anytime. Yep. Anytime you can. Mm. Yes, we encourage well, publication. Here's, here's what I, so, no. We encourage uh, publication. I can make contact with the, uh, the editor-in-chief for the Journal of Orthomonger Medicine and just kind of send a little phishing email and see if they're kind of interested. Okay, mm -hmm. that would be wonderful. Please do. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, with that, we're adjourned.